Welcome to Trinity's Distance Worship today. It's the third week in Lent. I want to be sure to remind you that we have our midweek Lenten virtual services that we're sharing with other uh, Lutheran congregations in the Cincinnati area. I hope you'll join in for one of those services. It's a brief time of worship followed by a brief online small group conversation about the service. And uh, I think those who have those who've been there have found it to be a good experience, making sometimes some surprising connections and meeting new folks, but also seeing familiar faces as well. I invite you to be sure to look at the good news for this week. Uh, there are a number of uh, schedule announcements about Holy Week. Of course, we have to do things differently this year, so you'll find uh, the listing of what uh, those plans are. In the good news and as well uh, you'll see the uh, reminder that we can order flowers for Easter we'll be worshiping outdoors we hope but it will still be lovely to have Easter flowers decorating that space if you don't have that good news uh, be sure to let the office know and and we can send you a copy finally I want to invite you to send images of your favorite crosses I've received a few and we'll be beginning to share those this week but would be glad to have more. And if it's a cross that has a story or some special meaning to you, please share that story with us as well. Now I invite you to join me in prayer as we begin worship. Holy God, through your Son, you have called us to live faithfully and act courageously. Keep us steadfast in your covenant of grace and teach us the wisdom that comes only through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our first reading comes from the book of Exodus, chapter 20. God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above, or that is on the earth beneath, or that it is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. 
punishing children for the iniquity of parents to the third and the fourth generation of those who reject me, but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work. You, your son or your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock, or the alien resident in your towns. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, but rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. Honor your father and your mother, so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord is your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or male or female slave, or ox, or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Our Gospel reading is from the book of John, chapter 2. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, Take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, What sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, This temple has been under construction for forty-six years, and you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. Hi kids. Hi everyone else. I hope you're all doing well. And how are you today, Mindy? I'm doing great, Wally. And I hope all you kids, both young and older, are doing good too today. Well, today we're going to talk about being wise or foolish. Mindy, can you tell us what it means to be foolish? Well, I think being foolish can mean different things at different times, Wally. Well, that's interesting. What do you mean by that, Mindy? Well, sometimes somebody is just being silly and goofing around, and so people say that they're being foolish. But I don't think that's what we're talking about today. Sometimes a person is being foolish because they aren't thinking things through, and they're doing something they really shouldn't be doing. Okay. Can you give us an example? Okay. We have a rule at school, at my school, that we are not allowed to talk without raising our hand. But sometimes one of the kids, <clears throat> not me of course, will start to talk to another kid without raising their hand, even though they know they're going to get in trouble. I think that's being foolish. I see. That's a good example. Say kids, I have another question. We'll give you a little time to think about it, then Mindy will give us her answer, okay? Here's the question. What does it mean to be wise? Hmm. Okay. Kids, have you thought about what it means to be wise? Here's my answer. 
A lot of times we think that being wise is knowing lots of stuff, don't we? We think because someone knows how to spell big words or knows multiplication tables up to 12 times 12, or maybe even knows quantum physics, they are a wise person. That's right, Mindy. We think that being smart means being wise, right? Right, but I think being wise means more than being smart. It means that you use good judgment and can tell what's right and what's true. I agree with that, Mindy. So why are we talking about being wise or being foolish, Wally? Well, Mindy, one of the Bible lessons for today is from the book of 1 Corinthians, and it talks about wisdom and foolishness. It says that people think it is what think people think is wisdom is not always wisdom and what people think is foolish is not always foolish that's kind of confusing wally can you explain a little more sure we all know that this is the season of lent right right well during lent we talk about jesus and his death on the cross don't we Yes, but what does that have to do with foolishness and wisdom? We're getting there. Answer this question. Why did Jesus die on the cross? To save us from our sins, right? Yes, but why would he do that? Well, I know that one thing for sure, because he loves us. Exactly. But you see, some people don't understand that. They think Jesus' dying on the cross was foolish, when really it shows that God's wisdom is far greater than anyone thought. Right, right, right. God knew that we cannot save ourselves, so he had to come up with a way to do it for us. That is so wise. Yep. So, kids, and everyone else out there in YouTube land, Remember that God loves you so much that even though it may not seem wise, he sent his only son, Jesus, to die on the cross so that we, might, we could get saved from our sins. God is wise. God is wise, isn't he, kids? Now, let us pray. Can you fold your hands and repeat after me? Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus, thank you for being so wise. Thank you for being so wise. And sending your son. And sending your son. To show us your love. To show us your love. By dying on the cross. By dying on the cross. Amen. Amen. Bye, everybody. Bye bye. See y'all later. Have a good weekend. Bye bye. Bye. This sermon has to start out with a little Bible study. Andy just read the story that's usually known as Jesus cleansing the temple from the Gospel of John. You probably know that our Bible records four Gospel accounts and they each basically tell the story of Jesus' time on earth. But each of the four is told from the point of view of a different author and with a different audience in mind. You know the traditional names of those authors, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You might know that some of the stories from Jesus' life are recorded by only one of the Gospel writers and that some are recorded by several of them. Just a few stories are included in all four Gospel accounts, and the cleansing of the temple is one of them. In the Bible, when something is repeated, that means we need to pay close attention. It's probably important. So when we hear one of the few stories that's repeated four times, we need to look at it carefully. But here's the thing. Matthew, Mark, and Luke all place this story near the end of Jesus' ministry on earth. In fact, they all have it happen right after Jesus has ridden into Jerusalem on a donkey. 
the event that we remember on Palm Sunday. And after each of the tellings of the story in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the Jewish leaders start to talk about getting rid of Jesus by killing him. But did you notice that Andy read from the second chapter of John? John has 21 chapters, so I think we can assume that something that happens in chapter 2 is probably not at the end of Jesus' ministry. In fact, the only things we've heard about Jesus in the Gospel of John before this story are that he is baptized, he invites some guys to follow him, and he goes to a wedding in Cana where he changes some giant jugs of water into wine for the reception. Then he goes to the temple. And in John, right after this story, Jesus meets the young lawyer named Nicodemus who wants to learn from him, not the whole group of Jewish leaders who want to kill him. Clearly, John is doing something different with the story of the cleansing of the temple. There's one other important difference in how the story is told in John. In Matthew, Mark, and Luke, Jesus clearly says that the temple should be a house of prayer, but they've made it into a den of robbers. Compare that to John where he simply says, stop making my father's house a marketplace. There are probably times when we might equate a marketplace with a den of robbers, but I don't really think Jesus is trying to critique business practices here. Because the buying and selling that he was complaining about weren't just commerce for the sake of making as much profit as possible. It was commerce that was built into the temple system. Remember, the Jewish people were required to sacrifice animals on the altar of the temple. And maybe they didn't have an animal. Maybe they had traveled so far to come to Jerusalem that they couldn't have kept an animal alive on the journey. Or maybe they lived right in the city and had no place to keep live animals. So in order to worship God, they had to be able to buy animals at or near the temple. If we look ahead a few verses, it might help us figure out what Jesus is trying to say. In his conversation with the Jewish leaders, he says, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Of course, they think he's talking about the building in which they're standing. But John gives us a helpful editorial note that he was speaking of the temple of his body. What might it mean that Jesus first critiques the way the temple is run, then deliberately confuses his own body with the temple. The temple, the pride and joy of the Jewish worshiping community, the center of their religious life, the place where, as devout Jews, they had to show up for the major festivals, God's house. I think Jesus was suggesting that they needed a new way to think about worship. That maybe they could worship God in other ways. That God could be found outside the temple. An interesting thought. A week ago, I had the privilege to lead a memorial service for the husband of one of our members. Some of you were there. The member made some special requests. She wanted the service to be done using Zoom because there would be family members and friends from many distant locations who would want to participate. This was my first fully virtual memorial service or funeral. We had done some live streamed from our sanctuary, but never before one that had no in-person component. 
Jonathan got busy and worked out the way we could have it using Zoom. He pre-recorded some of the organ music with Nancy and set up the recording system for me. And indeed, the relatives from various locations were able to come on and read scripture, share memories, and one even sang a beautiful rendition of Amazing Grace, accompanying himself on guitar. But what made it even more unusual was that our friend didn't want me to lead the service from Trinity's sanctuary. She had noticed the setting when I've led worship from home in my chair by the fireplace. And she really liked that. She wanted this memorial service to be led from that fireside spot. I thought about it a bit, and of course I ended up saying, why not? If Jesus told the Jewish leaders that they could worship God in a location other than the temple, then surely we can host a Zoom memorial service outside of our normal worshiping spot. And you can probably figure out where I'm going with this. This story, the cleansing of the temple from John, heard during Lent in our 13th month of being unable to worship in the ways and in the place to which we were accustomed, reminds us to think carefully about how we worship, who we worship, and where we worship. For the past year, we've been in exile. We've had to learn that we can worship God outside of Trinity's walls. And I'd like to suggest that this lesson is more important than we might think. Jesus tells the Jewish leaders to dismantle their elaborate system of animal sacrifice in that one specific building in Jerusalem. COVID has forced us to dismantle our expectation that worship has to be in the Trinity Sanctuary at 8.30 for traditional and 10.45 for breakout. Jesus tells the Jewish leaders that they will find the way to worship by following him. So how might we follow Jesus? to new and different ways of worship. We will return to worship inside our beautiful building sometime this year, I'm sure. But let us never forget that we can find Jesus and worship God in so many other places too. Amen.
on this third Sunday in Lent. Let our prayer reflect our confidence that you dwell not only in our holy buildings, but throughout all of creation. O God, our lawgiver, our temple, our wisdom, form your church to worship you alone. As you have blessed leaders throughout history, so bless our bishops for their ministry in church and world. Protect all who call upon the power of your name. As you have blessed martyrs for the sake of the gospel, so bless all the baptized who suffer for their faith. Even during this pandemic, connect us in diverse ways to our worshiping communities and give to all persons regular rest from their work. Bless with wisdom all parents and any who are granted authority over others and give to children the will to honor those who care for them. Keep the nations of the earth from engaging in war, bloodshed, and torture and help people of all ages to resist the lure of violence. Uphold marriages and all commitments of care and defend all persons, especially children, from physical, emotional, and sexual abuse. Guard your earth, its animals, and its plant life from all who would take for themselves more than they need. Train the diverse peoples of our nation to respect one another. Bless all who work to end discrimination and the oppression of the vulnerable. Use our bounty to meet the needs of others, those who are homeless or hungry, and hear our prayers for all who are sick or suffering, especially all afflicted with the coronavirus, and all we name here before you. Teach us how to pray also for ourselves. Receive our thanks for all who have died in the faith and bring us all at the end into the fullness of your life. We entrust ourselves and all our prayers to you, O faithful and gracious God, through Jesus Christ, our Savior, and Lord. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. You are what God made you to be, created in Christ Jesus for good works, chosen as holy and beloved, freed to serve your neighbor. God bless you that you may be a blessing in the name of the holy and life-giving Trinity. Amen.